GM. Yes, I wouldn't call it a fortune. Chess has not played that well. So this game, he was black against Ilfeld, and let's have a look. So it started e4. Now, when Keith plays his first move, he does it for a reason. He plays c6, the Karakhan, but unlike me, who probably plays an opening because I'm trying to maybe win, you know, in the middle game, he plays this because he wants to get a certain pawn structure. What pawn structure does he want to get? Well, after d4, d5, I'm going to just close the window because that mower is pissing me off. After d4, d5, one of the main lines in the Karakhan is knight to d2. And now we see one of the reasons Keith plays this opening, because he values, it's called the Keith hierarchy of pawns. And he carries, this is really what his philosophy to chess is. And it's an absolute set of values for each pawn. And it can be applied to normal positions, those you know uh where players castle one side or the other and it goes a bit like this it goes the b pawns are slightly less valuable than the c pawns so these are the b pawns they're less valuable than the c pawns so it's very interesting uh that's why for example he plays certain openings where he swaps the b pawn for the c pawn and all, all of his openings are based around his hierarchy of the pawns. He then goes on to say the C pawns, so the fire pawns in this file, are slightly less valuable than the D pawns. So you can see that it's going towards the center. And this is why he mentions Ben Larson as one of his favorite players in certain openings. And all of his openings are this. He also thinks that the E pawns are the most important pawns so the d pawn is a central pawn but he thinks the e pawns are worth more than the d pawns so you know you can go on and on with this and you can buy the book to read it more but actually in this position he now loves taking the pawn on e4 because he values the e pawn stronger so if you're going to put it a point value maybe he'd say the d pawn is 1.2 points and the e pawn is 1.3 points so he's actually winning points by swapping there so this is how he looks at pawn structures and we're just going to talk about this today and after knight takes e4 this is already a kind of pawn structure that keith loves playing because what's he trying to do well what keith is trying to do and again everything he's aiming for is based from his opening moves he's going to try to either swap the c pawn for the d pawn because remember the d pawn is worth more than the c pawn so he wants to maybe swap these guys off and then he'll be left with four pawns here and this is in the ending or middle game against three pawns here and these three pawns over here against these two pawns here and he loves keith loves having four versus three on the king side and what he tries to do with his two pawns here against the three pawns here is he tries to create a minority attack and he will try and win one of these pawns with his with his two pawns and be left later on with basically a position in the ending where he has four pawns versus three now this might all sound rather transcendental or like trippy or whatever you can call it but this is how he's won this is how he's made a living from this philosophy it's really quite bizarre so this is one way to play swap the c pawn for the d pawn and then try to minority attack the other thing he, he often says is that in this position black has no weaknesses but white has a weakness the d pawn the d pawn is a weakness and another thing he tries to do is just gang up on that pawn later on the other thing keith loves doing is having very compact pawn structures and another thing, I'm just telling you all the little things he talks about because we see them in operation the next couple of games. And the other thing he does talk about is with the E and F pawn, he doesn't like pushing the E pawn at all. This is, even when he's got the white pieces, he only likes moving the E pawn one square because he really values the E pawn. He thinks the E pawn is the most important pawn so he doesn't swap it off. 
So he might later on push the G and H pawns, but he won't move these pawns very far until the ending. Now this all might sound a bit weird, but if you understand the key hierarchy of pawn structure, you will understand why he plays his openings, why he plays the middle games, and how he wins the endings. And you can even model your game with this. Now this is a very good way to play if you're lazy, because you don't have to learn much theory. It's not about openings, it's about your understanding later on. It's very good if you're becoming a bit older, like I am, and you don't want to get involved in too many tactics. You know, you just want to play without thinking, because you know what you're doing, you know the pawn structures you're going for, you just want to go bang, bang, bang. You know, it's very good for people who don't have a lot of time on their hands. So it is a, it's a way of playing that a lot of you might be interested in doing. Okay, so, the next thing he does this stage of the game is he wants to exchange off some pieces because the pawn on d4 does give white more space when you have a slightly more cramped position you want to make some exchanges so they both now develop while Keith tries to make some exchanges so knight d7 trying to move this knight here knight to f3 now knight to f6 a little question if we go back to knight d7, I once saw a game where it was Richard Report, Hungarian Grandmaster, against an English FM, 2250. Richard Report played queen e2, and the FM played knight to f6. Now, this wasn't a mouse slip. It was actually played in the game. Why is knight to f6 a rather bad move? Anyone? Why is knight to f6 a bad move? It's, it's not nice because of knight to d6 checkmate put that in your pipe and have a smoke my son nasty um now the reason he doesn't go bishop f5 which i see people saying you can play bishop f5 but he, he doesn't want to he doesn't want to play theory this is all about being lazy it's all about avoiding theory. He's not going for the theory moves. He's just going for his normal strategy, exchanging pieces. And this can get quite tactical because the bishop here becomes a target. And white can attack this one. So Keith doesn't want to do that. That's why he goes knight d7. And he just wants to play knight to s6. Now the player of the white pieces is about 2200 strength. And after the exchange here, he's exchanged one pair of pieces off. Fantastic. Now, following up with Keith's way of playing, let's just say that white played something like c3 here. What do you think black should play here in this position? What would you play if you are black? So I'm looking at the chat. Let's try to make this as interactive as possible. You've got to imagine your Keith Arkal. What would you play with the black pieces here? And also give me a reason why. So you might have the right move, but what, what's the reason? What is the reason? What's the reason? H5. This is key for Arkham, not me, by the way. No one's given me a reason, though. Can anyone give me a reason? Now, the bishop might want to come out, but why? Why? It might want to come out, but why? Well, the way Keith is thinking, he wants his four pawns versus three. As I've said before, his favorite setup is kind of like with a pawn on e6. You don't want to pawn, put a pawn on e6 now because the bishop becomes terrible. It's trapped. So you have to move this bishop first. Where do you move your bishop? Do you move it to f5 or to g4? Now, moving it to f5, which a lot of you are suggesting, is not so good because it becomes a target. Yes, if white goes bishop d3, that helps you because you can swap off. But white, of course, does not play that move. Maybe white can even play knight to e5 and play something with g4 and h4. For example, e6 is what you want to play. And now g4, bishop here, h4. And already you can get yourself in quite a bad position with black. This bishop is a target. Now, Keith's whole philosophy is he doesn't mind exchanging. And he would have jumped at the chance after c3 to play bishop to g4. And after h3, what do you think Keith would do now? And remember, it's all about he's happy to exchange. Don't hold on to your bishops. People always say, oh, the bishop is so much better than the knight. He doesn't believe that, Keith. The bishops are not always good. 
Now, taking is definitely what Keith would play, and then he would play e6, and he's got his pawn structure. Keep an eye on that pawn structure for later on. Remember, his plan is to either go c5, try to exchange these two pawns, or to play on the d-file, first of all. This is his whole plan. So he's very happy with his position, and we're going to see this in the game. Now, the reason he wouldn't play bishop h5 here is because, again, white can play very actively. g4, bishop here, and this knight e5 move is always very annoying. And Keith wouldn't really want to allow this. I mean, he might play this sometimes, but given a chance to capture it, he would take away all the, all the activity from his opponent. So let's go back to the game. Now, the game continued with white playing knight to e5, a nice active move. And this kind of stops the bishop coming to these squares. If it goes to f5, you have to worry about g4 again. So Keith now has to think how he's going to develop his two bishops. And he plays bishop to e6, which may look odd. But after bishop e2, he didn't want to allow bishop to c4. How is he going to develop the bishop on f8? So what does Keith now play? And again, this is not very theoretical. This is why I like Keith's play. You don't have to learn openings to play like Keith. You have to be good at the ending. Yes, most of you got it right now. G6, because he just wants to get this bishop out. So let's just see how they develop. Castles, bishop g7, c3, Keith castles, all normal moves. Rook e1, putting the rook on what looks like a good open file. And now Keith wants to get rid of his opponent's best piece, which is the knight on e5. How do you go about doing that? So we're doing this step by step to play like Keith Arcar. How would you get rid of that knight there, would you say? Yes, knight d7. Just want to either get rid of that knight or force it to go away. We don't mind exchanging. Why don't we mind exchanging? Because we have a more cramped position. And the other reason we don't mind exchanging is because black has, in Keith's eyes, a better pawn structure than white. It's all about the pawn structure. Why does black have a better pawn structure? Hello, Perno. Because he's got the E pawn, which he thinks is the most valuable pawn. White doesn't. And because white has a slightly weak pawn on d4, he figures. That could be a target later on. So he's happy to exchange. So now, bishop to f3. And he just plays rook to f8 to guard this pawn. Bishop to f4. And now he plays a clever move. Every move's got an idea. Now, Keith would like to play bishop d5 here to swap off the bishops. Remember, the more exchanges, the weaker he's figuring white's pawn structure will be. But there maybe is a slight issue with bishop d5, and that is bishop g4. And if you play e6, bishop e2. And the problem here is that white has ideas with c4, and the bishop will be trapped. So first of all, Keith plays h5. And now this is very interesting. Now, he's pushing Harry, but not for the same reasons I push Harry. He's pushing Harry, number one, to stop white ever playing bishop g4. Number two, to give himself the g4 square, but really the whole idea is to swap off these bishops. So he's getting into the ending. You can see how he's just trying to swap things off. Now this, as Keith points out, would be a very bad move if white had a knight. So what Keith has done, he's made sure he's made certain exchanges that allow him to do stuff. If white had a knight, you would never play this move because of the g5 square. If a bishop goes to g5, it's not a problem. But if a knight gets to g5, it's a problem. Because a knight on g5 would cause a lot of issue. But there's no knights, he doesn't have to worry. So the game continues, queen e2, and now he goes bishop g4. Why not? Swapping off the bishop. h3, bishop takes f3, so he's swapping off all the pieces. Remember, it is called R. Carl's endings. And he is kind of the opposite to me, but actually I think we're quite similar in a way. I mean, every grandmaster can play tactical and endings, so you have to. And now he plays queen to d5, going for the ending. The queen takes a nice central point. He might go c5 next move, getting his the position he wants. But after queen takes d5, whose pawns, does black's pawn structure now get better or worse after pawn takes d5? If you've been listening, you can answer the question. How, who is this, who is this ha helped? Has it helped black or white? And why? 
what who's this queen capture actually helped who who you know has it helped we're looking at it from this yes well done mary hatman martin you are correct it has helped black because i said at the start of the show keith's hierarchy of pawns the b pawn is less is worth less than the c pawn so if you can ever swap your b pawn for the c pawn good the c pawn is worth less than the d pawn so if you can ever move your c pawn to the d file which black has done here your pawn has gained in value and the d pawn is actually worth less than the most important pawn the e pawn and this is how he bases all of his grandmaster strategy it's amazing so after king f1 white is now getting ready to bring his king to the center this pawn is not weak at all i don't know why you think it's weak it's really not weak keith will put it on e6 he'll have a lovely pawn structure you may think it's weak but it's not really even under attack it will just go to e6 it's actually a very nice solid pawn but now let's see if anyone can guess what black keith now plays and jen's chess you've got the right idea here so now he's got a structure he wants so the first stage of the game is over the opening is over now it's kind of middle game end game stage so now he does this is what he does in a lot of his games as we're going to see very shortly minority attack yes well done guys so now he hasn't managed to swap these two pawns off but what he has got he's got his minority of two pawns versus three pawns and the next stage in the way that keith plays chess is to use his two pawns to try and create weaknesses against white's pawns in blue and eventually win one of these pawns in blue and then he's going to try use his four versus three to win the ending so b5 is now the very famous minority attack this is one of the most important concepts positionally that you'll ever learn this is a very important this is all about pawn structures we're not really looking at tactics not yet we will do later now black's idea is to play a5 and b4 so a5 and b4 is black's idea now can anyone explain um verbally why this might be a good idea for black and this is what we call a minor it comes up in loads of openings the queen's gambit other openings so many times you'll get this pawn structure um so why does black want to play b4 what's the whole idea of the minority attack well let me explain to you the whole idea so let's say that white doesn't do anything and we just play this idea and we get this move in the whole idea of this is that it creates a weakness in white's quite solid pawn structure at the moment white has a nice solid pawn structure but as soon as you play b4 you create a weakness because whatever white now plays he's going to weaken his pawn structure the way keith plays chess is all about pawn structure well i mean i'm exaggerating obviously he's a great tactical player as well but we're concentrating his pawn structures here so for example if he takes on b4 how has this helped black you can answer the questions it's best you try to answer the questions yourself so you try to learn as you go on how has this helped black i mean i'm not even looking at the rook on the a file i'm just talking about the pawn structure how has this exchange help helped black's pawn structure well done mr potato um jeptar and everyone else um even donald trump wow you play chess donald there's a surprise <laughs> um the the weak d pawn this pawn is now very very weak it's what we call an isolated pawn in that it can't be defended by a pawn so at some point even black can try to attack this with a rook and that pawn is very weak forever so this helps black so what happens if white just plays king e2 what should black now play in this position how can black create another pawn weakness well black should take on c3 and all of a sudden the pawn on c3 now becomes very weak this is what we call a backwards pawn and again this is this is something that can't be defended by another pawn there's no pawn on one of these two squares in red to defend it so all black has to do now is gang up on that pawn and try to win that pawn eventually 
So you can see with this whole idea that keeps creating, it's actually quite lazy because all you need to know is the ideas. You don't need to know tactics, well, you obviously do a bit to make it work, but this whole idea works really well. Now, after this move, if white plays a4, we just play a6, it doesn't matter. It's, we have this coming up very soon. Instead of this move, white plays a3 to try and hold up this, this square. Now, I think the next move in this game is the hardest move to find. And I also think it's the best move of the whole game. Now, when you see the next move, you might be thinking, that, why is that a good move? That's not a good move. That's a crap move. What are you talking about, Simon? How can that be a good move? Now, one thing, like I mentioned before, is Keith does not like playing e5 until he has to. The whole philosophy of four pawns versus three, this is what he's basing everything on, is he likes keeping his pawns on e6 and f7. He doesn't like moving those pawns. Tiger sprung, well done. You've got it right. Um, anyone else? Tiger sprung, you've done very well, very well. What Keith now does, and you might be thinking this is not important, but it's such a brilliant move, is bishop f6. Now, why is that such a brilliant move? And it really is a brilliant move. It show, this is a grand master move. The reason for this is that black, his whole strategy is that he's not going to go for e5. That's not what Keith aims to do. Before he moves these two, and he has a majority of pawns, Keith always tries to create problems with his G and H pawns in the late middle game ending. This move prepares G5, maybe G4 and H4. Keith is trying to control both areas of the board with his pawns. It's a very, very good move. The other thing that Keith really talks about in depth here is that in order to win a game of chess, you need to create two weaknesses in your opponent's position. Now we've talked about the idea of going B4 and we'll probably create one weakness. Remember the C3 pawn. Well, creating one weakness positionally is not normally enough to win a game of chess because your opponent, you can attack that weakness with every piece and your opponent can defend that weakness with every piece. And this goes back to the days of, um, you know, like I say, the Soviet school of chess who dominated the world. They came up the principle where, I don't know if they came up with it, or two weaknesses. You need to create one weakness and another weakness. Once you've created two weaknesses, you can your opponent won't be able to defend both of them and their position will crack, you will win. What Keith is trying to do here, Keith is trying to create a weakness against white's structure over here. Another thing, and this is all very clever stuff, it might be a little bit deep and you might be thinking, I don't get it, but this is grandmaster strategy. Another thing that Keith is thinking here is that, okay, well, what is White's idea of a minority attack? Because White can try attacking with his three pawns against these. And something that White can sometimes try to do, let's just say Black doesn't do anything, is try to play the move F5. This is his minority attack. So he can try, I mean, it doesn't work very well here, but let's just say we don't do anything. He can try at some point to play F5. And this is white's minority attack. And this will create weaknesses in black's position, pawn structure wise. So another thing that bishop f6 does, it's gonna work against a minority attack. It's gaining space on that side of the board. And it really is probably the winning move. So now king to e2 is played. And white, like I say, is a, a good player, but he's drifting. And now black's idea comes into play, g5. Keith's favorite move. Now, I would like to say, Keith says, Martin, I, I, I mean, maybe I, I would disagree because of one of your favorite moves, Martin, but Keith, Keith has another philosophy. He says, if you're ever able to play the move G5 as black in the opening or mainly middle game, if you're ever able to play G5 in the middle game, that means that you have a good position, no matter what. Because 
G5 is kind of a luxurious move to play. If you think about it, how often do you play G5? You can't do it when you're castled. So it, when you play, if you're able to play G5, it probably means you've got a good position because you're king safe, you're making progressive moves. So I think that's quite an interesting thing I've never heard of before. And it keeps going up in your estimation. And now the bishop has to move and he plays H4. And what he's done now, he's kind of trapped these pawns because white does not have a pawn break. For example, he does, but if he tries it, it will actually make white's position worse. His two breaks, f4, g3. We're only talking about pawn structure, really. Now, f4. Now, going back to Keith's hierarchy of pawns, the f pawn is worth more than the g pawn. So if Keith can swap off his g pawn for the f pawn, Keith has one point. And now he's got even more central pawns and also he's got a good g file to work along so this would improve black's position if white plays g3 well he's going to swap off a more wing pawn for a more central pawn so again he will take here and white has to move his f pawn which is worth more to more of a side so white's losing points again and again you might have king g7 rook h8 attacking here if white takes to the bishop positionally that's horrible these pawns are split they become weaker so there we go okay so let's see how keith now does it so king d3 and now keith has made space he goes back to preparing this minority attack so rook c8 the rook is preparing pressure against there bishop e5 i don't know if white should be swapping off bishops but it maybe doesn't matter too much king g7 a4 white is trying to get active a6 just no i mean you, you it'd be a big mistake to take here because after rook takes all of, you know white suddenly a lot better so you have to really be careful so you want to keep this pawn rook a3 white preparing to double and now just e6 and this is the favorite pawn formation of keeps bishop takes f6 king takes pawn takes b5 pawn takes b5 rook a1 rook to b8 and let's just have a think about this it looks like white has gained a lot because white's got the open file but if we think about the pawn structure everything is going the way keith wants it to go keith is preparing the minority attack with b4 he can also later on maybe try g4 black doesn't really have any weaknesses this is the only slight weakness if white tries to activate it's not a problem because f7 could be defended easily now white doesn't want to allow black to play b4 so for example rook a7 b4 and black is going to create those weaknesses we're talking about earlier so white plays b4 himself to stop that but now he's created another weakness and now what do you think black should now play so black now goes back to the concept of trying to create two weaknesses he has one weakness but he needs to find another way into the position what would you now play as black here we're looking at this game very deeply aren't we today surprising okay we might not be able to look at a lot more well what's your idea with king f5 you've got to tell me your idea king f5 is is an idea but king f5 and g4 okay maybe jeptar you have it right rook to g8 very simple you know these ideas don't require they're they're you know i like them they're like nice simple well they, they're simple but they're not if you see what i mean and he just wants to create a second weakness he wants to go g4 and win on g2 so if white plays rook a7 we just go g4 we can always defend that one and if white takes this one all of a sudden g2 is very weak if white doesn't take we're going to take and bring our rook into g2 so now white plays king at f3 but f3 has created a hole it's created a hole there so now black plays king f5 and he's trying to come in to that hole now e5 would be a horrible mistake remember we're talking about pawn structures and the whole idea of keith's pawn structure is you don't play e5 this is why he's a grandmaster e5 makes black's pawn structure a lot worse white would simply take this one and you've just weakened your pawn on d5 this pawn on d5 is isolated it can't be defended by a pawn and later on white might be attack this plan so positionally you've made your position a lot worse thank you for the raid shogi harbor very kind 
So this would not help. And this is, remember, we're look, talking about Keith's philosophy. Keith does not like moving his pawn further than e6. We don't want to play e5. This is not what Keith does. He leaves the pawn there until later on. He doesn't want to split his pawns. So he goes king f5. And he's trying to come in here. And now king e3, stopping that idea. Maybe a little mistake. And now he goes back to c8, tying down the rook here. Rook f1. And now he increases the pressure on one weakness. And this is very, very hard now for white to defend. Rook to c8. And we're going to have two pieces attacking c3. And it's, it's going to be really hard to defend. Because, for example, if you try to go rook c1, rook here. And let's say if the king moves, you lose control of f4. So now black's king can start making progress. If white just sits here and tries to play this move forever, how would you try? How would you basically get a, a very good position here? So after rook to c2, what would black now play? What's a good move here for black to play? Good move for black to play. Well, f6 is okay, but merry hat man, you've got it. Rook to c4. And you have now the threat of rook takes b4 because of the pin. And this position is really creaking for white because we've created another weakness, the g3 square. So if white defends like this, we can now make progress coming in this way. And maybe only now, uh, Perno, do we consider going f6 and e5. I'd want to take on e5 with a pawn. So for example, let's say white does nothing. I can come in, but I can also now maybe play for e5 here. And the point I've gone f6, I want to get two pawns in the middle like this, a better structure. Okay, so now white tried f4 himself, but Keith just played g4. And now his king's become super active. White tries to block the king coming in. And now a very nice idea. What did Keith now play? And this is real pure ending stuff here. So we've really created a weakness here. We've got some areas over here we can try to come into. But how are we going to win? Maybe we need to activate our pieces at some point. Keith now goes about activating his rook in the best way possible. How can Keith activate his rook in the best way possible here? Well, rook to g8 and king f5 trying to take on g2 is one idea, but it's an even better idea. T tiger sprung. Now, tiger sprung, you've even, you've, you have either brought Keith's book or you're a bloody good player. Rook on b to b7. Now that white's rook has lost control of the a-file, look, we've tied that down. That rook has become passive now. It can't control the a-file anymore, so black now takes over the a-file with the idea of getting a rook active. One of the most important things in a rook and pawn ending is to have an active rook. White can't do anything about it because the c-pawn is on pre, so he has to wait. King f2. Rook a7, and now the rook is getting in. Rook takes a7, rook takes a7, and look at the rook. The rook is a beautiful piece here. Now, f5 was tried from white. If white plays king to g1, can anyone see? Can anyone see black's winning strategy? Black has a winning strategy here. What is black's winning strategy? I don't want to hear just one move. One move is not a winning strategy. You either explain it in a sentence, explain it in a sentence, or you tell me a series of moves. So e hatipo, very nice, very nice. You've actually got kind of the right idea. You want to get the rook to this square. Because if you can get the rook to this square, you can win this pawn. And if you win a pawn in the ending, you're winning. So that's very, very good. You've got the right idea. Now h3 doesn't work. You don't really want to allow rook takes h3. Okay. You know, you can take that pawn, but don't exchange pawns. You're allowing that rook to get active. For example, if you played this, yes, you win a better pawn, but now this rook has suddenly become active. And I might even use that one. Don't allow your opponent's rook to get active. There's no need to play h3. Definitely not. So, Mr. Unknown, the crazy dude's got it right. The winning idea is actually much simpler. We put our rook on c2 or on e2. This is what we're aiming to do. We're aiming to get our rook to one of these two squares when black will be winning. For example, let's have a look. So um, king f1, sorry, um, king g1, 
Rook a2. Now king f1. You have to stop this idea. We now play rook c2. And in this position, white is in what we call zugzwang. Meaning that any move that white plays, he loses. Now I would say this book is probably aimed more at beginner to intermediate. Because what Keith does, which is unique to this book, he explains everything without variations. I'm telling you variations here, but he doesn't use really any variations. It's all explained in words. So it's the kind of book, it's got lots of diagrams. You can read while you're on the toilet and you'd be like, oh, I've learned a bit about the ending there. You don't even have to get a board out. It's great for lazy people. Great for lazy people. So I think it's I think it's really good. I mean, I'm not just saying that. Very proud to have Ginger GM publish this book. Now, let's think about this position, a position of Zugzwang. We, I, I know Jerry from Ireland yesterday called it Volkswagen. Zugzwang basically means any move that one side plays makes the position worse, hence why he calls it Volkswagen. Any move the Volkswagen does, it becomes worse. Uh, and so try to find a move for White. White can't move, he's in a kind of weird stalemate. If he goes Rook F2, we just take that one, we win there. If he goes rook to e3 or d3, we just win a pawn. And obviously if you try to take here, I'll take on c3. If you move your king, well if you go here, I take on g2. And if you go to g1, we actually play e Hattipo's idea. Rook to e2, and the rook is just going to win that pawn. Very, very nice idea. Okay, so let's have a look how the game finished. So white tried f5, Keith simply took this one. Rook e3, white has the right idea, he's trying to activate his rook, but now black's rook comes in, forcing the white rook back. He doesn't want to allow rook e5. Whenever you're trying to win endings, you have to be very aware of your opponent's idea. White's idea is rook here, Keith stops it. The rook instead comes to e6, and now Keith starts attacking these pawns. He wins the pawn there. Black is a pawn up, but it's not easy to win. Rook d6, and now a very clever move. Only now h3. And after pawn takes h3, what would you now play as black in this position? Would you go rook takes or king takes? What would you now play as black in this position? Shogi, well done there. Something, Dr. Awkward, Merry, late very good the winning move i try to trick you there this pawn on h3 is irrelevant it's much more important to combine these three pieces together the white king is on the back rank it's in a very precarious situation and by playing king to f3 we actually threaten checkmate and we stop white from taking our pawn here because if it's taken that is checkmate so this pawn is irrelevant. We don't want to win that pawn. We don't need to. So this move, much better. And the king can, can combine to defend and do a Pac-Man. Take all those pawns. And if you look at the king, it's funny how White's king started off earlier on being very active. But now it's become incredibly weak. Now, what does white do? He even moves the king one of these ways. In the game, he went king g1. If he goes king e1, we just go king e3. We threaten checkmate again. And next move, we're going to win this pawn with a winning position. After king g1, Keith now gets his rook to a slightly better square. Every idea of Keith's is to improve his position. He calls it micro plans. This is why it's great for lazy players, older players, players who, players who want to sit there and not calculate too much. You don't have to think 10 moves ahead when you play like Keith. He does, by the way, he's a grandmaster. You only need to think one or two moves ahead. You've got to think, how can I improve that piece with a little one or two move tactic? Well, he does it by going check, forcing king h2, and now rook c2 check, and now he's got his rook to a better file. He's got it to the seventh rank. So he's doing micro plans. King g1, and now a very clever idea. And it's, you know, you have to be careful. If, if white can take here, it, it might not be good. And if we keep trying to checkmate like this, then white can keep dodging us. And we're not going to make any progress, are we? So we have to do something. And now what Keith does, 
Keith now plays rook g2 check because he's either trying to force the white king into a worse square right in the corner or into this square here. Now in the game king h1 was played but if king to f1 is played Keith's idea is to now move the rook to d2 threaten checkmate and win the pawn there. The white king has to move and now black simply wins the game by taking this pawn. So king h1 is now played and now rook d2 is played anyway and this is an amazing position. Now why can't white play rook takes d5 here? So it's involving little tactics, micro plans whilst improving your position. Why, is, why can't white play rook takes d5? He can't play that move and I think Jeptar, you've got it right. He, White has to keep his rook for checks. If he plays this one, the f pawn plays a very important role. It blocks checks. And after king g3, all of a sudden, White is checkmated. <laughs> Can you believe it? Out of nowhere. Where did that come from? Whoa! And all of a sudden, there's no way to stop rook d1 checkmate. So this means White can't take that pawn. So white now plays rook to f6, trying to take that pawn. But now Keith just, he can he does have time to win this pawn, so he does. He goes king g3. This is checkmate. White has to play rook g6, and now Keith has time to take this one. You might as well take the pawn if you can. And the position, he comes back to this position but he's grabbed that pawn, why not? Now rook to b6 is played, and after rook takes d4, white now resigns. I'm gonna ask you the last question, why can't white play rook takes b5 here? Why can't white take the pawn on b5 in this position? White ends up resigning because black is now gonna take that one. Is it, oh, king f2 is nice actually, I didn't even see that. I didn't see king f2. There's two ways to checkmate. Yes, if white takes his pawn, king g3, I was thinking of, and again, with the same idea, is checkmate here. There's nothing white can do to stop it. But actually, some of you have pointed out, you can also go this way. This is very nice. And you've got this checkmate. The white king totally stuck in the corner of the board. Very, very nice. So he made that look so, so simple, I think so simple but it was all micro plans he knew exactly what he wanted in the ending and it all came about from his opening strategy his middle game play the exchanges is made but everything about the pawn structure and this is what he bases a lot of his games on now i'm going to show you one game i'm going to show you the next game a lot quicker a lot quicker because I'm already done an hour now and I can only stream for another half an hour. Um, I'm afraid, I, I, I've got, a, got some other stuff I need to do, but I wanna show you another game which uses those same principles. And this whole book basically has those principles in it. And like I say, there's loads of diagrams. It's a very nicely done book. And you can see there's no variations. I've just, put, I've just picked a, a random page. When I say there's no variations, it's just concepts. So you can see here, he talks about king a5. He doesn't go into variations. So you can look at the diagram and you can say, oh, so this is what he's trying to do in this position just by him telling you the plan, which I like it. Uh, thank you, Shogi Harper, for the, for the uh, raid. So I'm gonna show you one more game now. Um, let me just pick a good game. Uh, we've got Andrew Ledger, Ivanka Huska. Uh, let me just pick. Okay, well, I'm going to now pick, I'm going to go this much quicker because I've talked about, I've talked about his principles. You can always watch this stream again. I'll put it up on YouTube if you want to get this free lesson. But what I want to talk about now is that same strategy, that same strategy. Now Keith's got the white pieces. So let's talk about that strategy very quickly again. Now Keith thinks the E pawn is the most valuable pawn. So Keith will never play E4. Oh, he actually thinks e4 might be a mistake because the e-pawn comes weak. And he actually thinks it's a mistake because of the Sicilian. And the Sicilian opening is where black is able to get rid of his c-pawn for white's central pawn. So black's already better. This is actually something that uh, one of the greatest Danish chess players, Bent Larsen, actually said. Bent Larsen never played the open Sicilian because he liked black structure. Um, 
but we're going to have a look now Keith is white here so talk about it it's all about his pawns and what Keith likes having is these four pawns versus these three this is what he's going for and then he likes to have sort of something like two pawns so let's put them in red shall we two pawns versus three pawns over here and he likes to use a minority attack to try and win one of those pawns and this is often it's all about the pawn structure so let's have a look he's playing a very strong um i think woman grandmaster or woman international master toma from england so keith now plays d4 and we're going to go quicker and we go into potentially a king's indian or something else and now keith plays g3 the reason keith plays g3 is he's very happy to see d5 because then he'll be able to swap one of his weaker pawns for one of black's stronger pawns a central pawn for a side pawn and the other thing that i do want to note is is that thank you for anyone who's describing etc as we go along keith doesn't like moving this e pawn remember that he only likes moving it to e e3 so it keeps it very compact and solid so he doesn't want to touch that guy so g3 and now we do have the Grunfeld and Keith's very happy because Keith has managed to swap this pawn for this pawn. Knight c3, both sides develop according to theory. Knight c6, and now what does Keith do? He doesn't play anything tactical, he plays e3 and he gets this. It's very similar to the last game. If you just think about structures, he gets his structure very, very compact and he has the minority attack, two pawns versus three pawns. And the other thing, the reason that Keith plays this opening is that if black plays e5, which he might do, Keith will take that pawn and he's got his ideal situation. Let's have a look at that. Both sides develop, rook e8, b3, put the bishop on b2. These are not, you know, but he, Keith's just doing normal moves, very clever. e5, and now the main line is often d5, but Keith is like, right, perfect. I can take off my opponent's e pawn my opponent's e pawn is worth more than my d pawn knight takes e5 everything gets exchanged and after the exchange let's have a look at the pawn structure keith has got four pawns versus three yes keith's happy he's got his minority attack against toma's three pawns so generally this is exactly what he wants so now we have a maneuvering stage keith now maneuvers and he gets rid of this good bishop but also his knight has a very nice square on d4 another reason he likes having his pawn on e3 is to support the d4 square now what watch out for that square more exchanges he doesn't matter we're talking about endings and the knight now has that square and this is why he keeps his solid formation bishop e4 and now he plays f3 he doesn't always play that move but in this situation it's very safe because his king can support and they both play some maneuvers here not much going on and eventually after more maneuvers we can see that keith starts to use his four pawns and remember he doesn't play e4 often he normally goes to g4 or g5 and this forces a favorable pawn exchange because if black does not exchange then we're going to create a weakness on f5 if black does exchange, then white has this lovely passed e pawn. So everything's about the pawn structure. So white takes on b3. He now brings, sorry, black does. He, Keith doesn't mind swapping that one off. It doesn't matter. You've got to be careful of counterplay. c5 is threatened. So he goes b4. He's stopping c5. And he's using this minority attack. Now one pawn versus two. f takes g4. h takes g4. h5 rook g1 we're going to get straight into the ending now and after c5 keith goes about even with all these exchanges after many maneuvers he's gonna try to prove that this pawn is weak because his pawns can defend each other so white's idea is to win this pawn and then win the ending the four versus three has turned into two versus one but look how good that knight is defended and even after all these maneuvers, he gets this kind of ending. And I wanted to sort of, you know, talk about this. 
This is the kind of position Keith gets time and time again from the pawn structure. And I find it amazing. Now, a lot of people might think this is a draw. Maybe it is, should be a draw, but he's won so many games like this. And the problem is, you know, it's really hard to defend. As long as you can stop G5, if black can swap the G pawn for the F pawn, it's a dead draw, dead draw. But if he can't do that, then I think white can slowly move his E pawn up the board. Now, the reason it's a dead draw, if you remove both of these pawns, is that the E pawn can always be sacrificed for the bishop. Rook and knight versus rook with nothing else on the board is quite an easy draw at top level. But let's see what Keith does. Well, first of all, Keith goes to stop g5. He doesn't want to allow that one. That's priority. And now he's happy even to swap off these guys. Now, the next stage of his plan is to fix the move g5 so that his king can come around this way. So in order to fix that move, he needs to get his knight stopping g5. For example, if he tried king g3 now, black would play g5 and it would be an easy draw. So he does this in stages. This is what the book talks about. First stage, stop this one, move the king and prepare e4. So he goes knight to f3. The knight is coming around. If the knight is taken, it's an easy one ending. Bishop f5, king g3. And let's just see, now he, his king comes around. He stopped g5. And he's also now ready to use the e pawn. The e pawn comes forwards. So he now uses that e pawn and the king as much as he can. Now that g5 is secure and he's got his e pawn here and his king active, he goes to stage two of his plan. And stage two is, as he says, to bring the knight back to d4. Why does he want to do that? Because he wants to play the move e5, but he doesn't want to play it now because it allows king f5 and then his pawn will be in trouble. There's no rush. So his idea is to cover the f5 square so that he can play e5, stopping the king coming here. To do that, he needs to get his knight here. It's all micro plans. So how does he do it? Well, he brings his knight back, king here. And if g5 is played now, you can play f5. And these two connected pass pawns win the games we're going to see we're going to see later on so now after king f7 e5 is played the pawn is getting more dangerous and around here i think it's clear to see that his plan of just advancing is easily winning because this pawn is going to be pretty much unstoppable so it's just little plans now before i end the stream um i want to just show you um King e7 is a dead draw instead of king, what, here? Whereabouts? I, I don't believe you. There's, there's no dead draw. There's never been a dead draw. This is one thing you'll look at with Keith's games. There's, his games may look drawn, but there's, no, there's no, no such thing. He was actually telling funny stories. Often after he gets these endings, he wins them all the time. And often after, after the game, he will actually, his opponent will say, I was easily drawing there had I played this move. And Keith being the gentleman normally just says, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he actually knows, he actually knows that maybe it's a table-based draw. So what? But dead draw, easily draw. No, there's no such thing. I mean, okay, let's, what, king e7 here? I don't know where you mean. But even in these positions, this is not dead draw. Maybe it's a draw if black plays perfect chess. But how often does that happen? It doesn't happen. If g5, by the way, white is always going to go e5. I mean, if you go king e7, dead draw, I just don't believe it's a dead draw. You can certainly try to win this position. I mean, I can go king e5, try to attack the g pawn. I can slowly try to avoid. I can do lots of things. I'd be quite confident about winning this position. Maybe it's a theoretical draw, but that's different to being dead draw. And a lot of time, the other thing that Keith plays, Keith basically plays to you know, without risk. He's either going to win or draw. He's not going to lose many games. So, um, I, you may have seen this tactic before, but we're just going to have a look at two examples from Keith's games now. And uh, da, 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 da. now let's just see. This first example, maybe you've seen a lot before because I've shown it before, so I'll go over it quicker. And Keith is white here. Now, after Queen takes c7, Black now plays queen takes d3. 
and it looks like Keith is completely lost because black is threatening queen takes f3 and also queen e3 queen f2 checkmate so let's say for example you play queen d7 queen takes f3 is checkmate the king goes here queen g2 checkmate if the queen is taken rook takes e1 is checkmate very beautiful now if white plays queen takes c6 to stop that idea maybe attack the rook black can just play queen e3 and queen f2 is checkmate so it looks like Keith is in a diabolical position but the next move he plays there he plays in this position is one of the most amazing moves I've ever seen what is white's best move here maybe you've seen this before but what is white's best move yeah I mean if you want free videos then I do have a YouTube video lots of free videos and, and stuff like that but if you want to get one of the free ginger GM ones you have to win one so what is the only move that white can play here well Queen g3 I just play Bishop takes g3 and you're losing no nope, it's not Queen g3 uh, <laughs> it's one of those ones where you might have seen it before but it's still hard to find the move Martin so don't worry I think we'll look at one more segment of Keith's game after this. I'm sure you know how to use Google, Chess Guy, 1976. Google is, you type it into Google, for example, Chessable Free Course, and it will come up with it. Come on, use bloody Google, my man. Will Keith's, will Arkar's endings teach us how to win with Bishop and Rook versus Rook? Well, Killian, I don't know about that. He's got some of that in there, but uh, <laughs> that is Keith in the, has won that like 16 out of 16 times. Has anyone got the right move yet? Killian, can you find the move? I see one person has got the right move, but I'm not going to mention who it is. One, two people have got the right move now. White to play. What is the only move here? The only move. White to play. Only one move in this position. Imagine you're white here. What's your only move? You're close but no cigar, Killian. Close but no cigar. Why is, why is queen c8 not so good? Queen e3 against queen c8. If you go queen to c8, then queen e3, I think black is winning, yeah? Because of this threat here. The only move is queen to d8. One of the most brilliant moves I've ever seen. One of the most brilliant moves I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, look at this. You put your queen under attack from not one, but two pieces. Yeah? And now the point is, you want to divert either the rook or the bishop away. So if the rook takes the queen, now you can take black's queen and there's no checkmate white is a pawn up in the ending if black goes bishop takes queen the bishop is not threatening here anymore so white can again take the queen and there's no checkmate if black tries queen takes f3 you can take the queen and now the rook is pinned to the king so black can't move the rook because it would be moving into check if black tries queen to e3 threatening checkmate here white can go queen takes bishop and white is uh white is actually amazingly uh, um a, a rook up so this is one of the most amazing moves i've ever seen queen to d8 look at that for a move how i mean imagine this i mean i i think often imagining scenarios is a very important and powerful skill uh, let's say you're playing in a big tournament and you're really excited and you can imagine your opponent resigning you can imagine winning it or you can imagine yourself playing a brilliant game or a brilliant move that can give you a lot of positive energy i you know i would often imagine doing moves like this against the top seed in the british championships to win the british championships and it would excite me and look at this queen to d8 what a move that was this is against james holland and keith plays this unbelievable move I mean, had I ever played a move like that in my lifetime, I would be extremely proud. What a bloody good move. 
But you know what? It's not Keith's favorite ever move. I'm gonna show you that now. And this is a position, uh, let me just, I hope I've got it. Um, okay, so now this is Keith's favorite ever move. This is a position Keith had against Ganinsky, who is a grandmaster from Hungary, maybe, or maybe Croatia. This is a really tough puzzle. Now, Keith asked, showed this position, the story goes, to 20 international masters or and grandmasters. And not one, not one grandmaster got the right answer to this. So the question is, and this is a little bit different because it's not an outrageous win. It is, what is the best move for black? Um, this is the position I think he's most proud of. White's just played knight to b3. And what should black play here? Black is one pawn down, so black is probably trying to draw this position. You can't win this position. What, what should you be playing as black? Now, if you don't do anything, white will slowly improve his position, like king g2 to avoid any check. Maybe then knight comes into c5 later on. White can improve his position. So you can't really sit here and do anything because white has this extra pawn. Now, Navid has suggested the move c5. Now, this is a first fault of a strong player. You're trying to force the liquidation of the position. Now c5, if you follow this move, well done. But it doesn't work. Now white can't play pawn takes because you win the queen, but white can play knight takes c5. And if you play bishop takes c5, for example, and then queen takes c5, and now you try to come in with some checks here, for example, queen d1 check, where should white put the king where should white put the king this is very important we're, we're thinking this in a very logical way where does the king now move one of these squares is a mistake and one of them is is a good square now h2 is correct and white should be winning his two pawns up now king to g2 is probably a mistake why is this one probably a mistake? Jen's chess, you're right. Knight to f4, check. Perpetual check. Because if you take this one, then queen comes here, check, and it's perpetual, like this. If you come to the h file, I just go to the same squares. It doesn't matter. There's no way you can escape, and it's a draw. So c5 is nearly working, but it's not working because of here. If you go queen d1, check, then queen f1 is also a move that white has and white should be winning this position, yeah? So after bishop takes c5, queen takes c5, queen d1 check, white should be winning by putting the king here because he's defending f2 and his pawns can slowly or quickly come down the board. So this gives quite a big clue as to what black should do but the move is really really hard but you've got to have the right reason so what did keith play here he wants to play c5 to force this from a forces to occur but he can't do it now so what does he need to do here but what is the idea what is the idea well taking here is just is going to lose in the long run i mean some kind of ending like this I think it's just simply losing. You know, the white king's gonna come in, the bishop, you're just a piece down. You know, I don't believe this can be drawn. The knight will probably pick up here. I mean, it's gotta be lost, you're a piece down. There's no place. So you can't You can't give up on b4, I, I don't think. So it's not that one. Anyone else? Ah, uh, testosterone. Testosterone is the only person who may have the right answer. And the right answer is Keith's favorite move, G5. Now this is, I think, an amazing move. It may not look like it, but it's amazing. 
And the idea is, in, this, in the last variation, when the king comes to h2, black will have queen to h5 check. You remember that last line? Queen to h5 check. And it's really quite amazing. I mean, Keith is a pawn down, basically. Any normal move will leave him struggling without much of a chance of survival. So this is the only move he can play to try and get c5 to work. And I think this is unbelievable. So let's have a look at what happened. Well, white, in a, in a, in a moment of shock, took here. And now c5. And... Anyone, you know, we, we saw Keith's amazing endings, but you can also calculate like a monster. And the point now is we, if we have the same variation, knight takes c5, we now play bishop takes c5, queen takes c5, queen d1 check, and when the king comes to h2, there's no pawn on h4, so we go queen to h5 check. When the king comes to g2, what is the important move here that you play? What is the important move you play here? Correct, knight to f4 check. And this is the whole point behind the sequence. Pawn takes f4, queen g4 check. It's this perpetual check that we've seen before and black gets the draw. So I just feel, really think this g5 move that no grandmaster has really found is amazing. And I wonder if the, the top grandmasters will play it. It's to be able to play queen h5 check. So let's go for that again. The game went pawn takes here, c5. Now only now did white realize that knight takes c5 would be a draw. So instead white decided to play king g2. But the problem is after pawn takes b4, Pawn takes b4, and now queen a2. The bishop is attacked. There's also ideas of knight e3 check. Bishop c1 is the only move to protect that one. And now bishop takes b4. And now we've got to reevaluate the position. Now, black is a pawn down here, but black is incredibly active. He wasn't before. White's extra pawn is also of little value. And the position is actually dead equal. White can't activate his pieces. We've also got this lovely knight. And the game ended with queen c8, king g7, knight d4, and now bishop c3, and they agreed a draw. Because this pawn is no good. The knight defends any checks here, and black has got this activity. Now, like I said, this is very high level stuff. But the idea of playing g5 is really an absolute stroke of genius. Uh, combined with this incredibly hard move to find c5. And the main point is so that our queen can come to h5 with check. There's no longer a pawn on h4 blocking the check. So if we have this tactical sequence, we have the check and we have the perpetual. Now, probably white shouldn't take on g5. You're right there. But if white doesn't take on g5, then black is opening up the white king. And this probably helps him. So, you know, 100% correct that he shouldn't take on g5. But I'm sure a lot of people will be in a state of shock and, and do that anyway. I think it's a, 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 normal, a normal thing to do. Um, okay, so there we go. So we've looked at uh, Keith's endings there. A little bit of a lesson. If you miss the st start of it, you can go and have a look. Uh, I'll put it up on YouTube, my YouTube channel. Do go and check out my YouTube channel as well because it's bloody excellent. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to... I have to now go. I hope you all had... An interesting time I'm I think I'm commentating for the next four days solidly on the chess.com channel um, on the end of the chess Olympiad so we're gonna see if American can get the gold medal how Europe are gonna do so I think I'm literally doing 10 10 hours of commentary the next four days so you can catch me on the chess.com twitch channel if you want to see my commentary I hope to see you there do you remember the book is on sale uh, our book 
that I was just talking about. I gave you some free lessons there, but if you want to get a copy of the book, then you know there is a link to the book. It's very easy to uh, very easy to uh, um, follow, and you should you should have a lot of fun. Uh, reading it and you should learn something the video course will be coming out soon there is a video to come out of the book hopefully the video course will be ready for ready to buy I think it's about 12 hour videos explaining in a similar way to what I explained there hopefully make you a better player but we've got Keith explaining it he, he it'd be nice to see him explaining so have a great rest of the day Blair I'm gonna just to get some shopping done, I'll give you a message and meet up with you shortly.